you know, figure out what, how to solve this. So I'll give you about 20 more seconds and then we will share out. About 10 more seconds. Three, two, one. Okay. Any brave souls out there? I see people smiling. Can we solve this equation with these numbers? I'll give you a hint. No, <laughs> we can't. However, um, and just like what I did with the timing and giving a countdown, I do this with my students as well. And this is the next strategy that I do with my students. Let's talk about something simpler. So if you eliminate, just forget about the equation. What do you see? What are these? You can type in the chat or unmute. What do you see? Odd numbers, good. Numbers, excellent. So besides numbers, what are they? They're pool balls. Thank you, William. What can balls do? What do balls do? You play a game and they can also roll. Yes, they can spin. Does that help you solve this equation? Can you spin a ball here to help you solve that equation, and it might change an odd number to an even number, yes. So that nine suddenly becomes a six. And so when we are thinking about these things, it's encouraging students to think outside of the box and getting them there, right? We want them to know you can do this, right? And I often tell them the reason I start off class with some kind of a brain teaser, and over the course of the year, I will add text but it's so that they can, they can figure out how to learn, right? We are learning that it's okay to make mistakes, but we learn better together and, and they can do it. So I'm always amazed. I generally have at least one kid in my class solve this and it's awesome. So I encourage you, brain teasers, is, it's a great way to get things started. And especially a warm up when people are walking into the room and on a Monday, they're a little groggy and tired. So these are two quotes that I love. They are both about language. I'll let you read them on your own, but I do just wanna talk a little bit about the first one. Um, James Paul G, he is a linguist, he's a researcher. And this short phrase is kind of my motto for teaching language learners, language is power. And I often say when a student cannot communicate verbally and in our schools in English, they seem powerless because they are. Oftentimes people don't know what they're thinking. They have a hard time expressing it. So I really try to keep this in mind, especially in the larger context of equity. So I love these two quotes. So as I introduce myself, I wanted to uh, get your ideas a little bit about strengths and challenges of working with English language learners in the classroom. Feel free to share in the chat if you would like to respond, that's great. Um, if you don't want to, not a problem at all. So like um, Adam said, my name is Erin Vanacore and I teach at a middle school in New York in Westchester County. It's in the suburbs of New York City. And at the middle school, I teach small groups of newcomers and slave students, uh, English language learners. And then I also co-teach math, science and uh, English language arts classes. I'm a mentor for new teachers and I'm a part of the building equity team as well, which um, has been a, a big part of schooling in the last couple of years, especially with virtual education um, all across the country, L's 
you know, struggled with other students, of course, in the virtual context. So that has become a, a real interest of mine. And most recently, I worked as an English language fellow with the Department of State. That's actually how I know Tabitha. Um, and I taught at a university online in Mexico for pre-service teachers and the, um, the faculty there as well. And it was a, an amazing experience. So I encourage any of you, if you're interested in doing something um, outside of a K-12 realm, that program is wonderful. It's open to K-12 teachers. And I also last year participated in TED, which is that little symbol at the bottom. Again, another amazing opportunity for K-12 teachers in the United States. They pair about, um, I believe it's about 25 US teachers and 25 teachers from Europe. And you get to collaborate on really cool projects and you earn obviously um, PD for it or credits. So two awesome programs that I recently were, was uh, lucky enough to be a part of and I learned quite a bit from. So here is my contact information down here, my email address. I'm so old school, I still have Hotmail. <laughs> but um, so thank you for today's coming to today's presentation using gifted and talented methodologies to enhance ESOL instruction. And I also forgot to mention um, in New York State, it is now called ENL. So if you see ENL teacher, it just means English as a new language because it may not be a student's second language. English might be their third or fourth. So it's a little bit more of an inclusive term, I suppose, but that's officially what it's called in New York State now. So today, let me just check the chat here, see if anybody, uh... oh, still don't get it, that's why I don't teach math, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't know if anybody wrote about strengths or challenges of uh, L's in the classroom. So here is our agenda and objective for today. And I'm really hoping that you can leave today's session with a few strategies in your pocket so that you can actually apply them in your teaching. Um, that is really important for me. So I hope that you walk away thinking like, oh, okay, cool. I might try that and it might help uh, intended student outcomes. So we're going to go over four specific gifted and talented strategies to enhance project-based learning for the L's in your classroom. And today we will go over the strategies, the connection between gifted and talented and um, ESOL. You'll have an opportunity to work in a breakout room for a few minutes with colleagues. And then we uh, will continue along. I'll share some examples from my classroom and then we'll have time for questions and answers as well. So what is the connection between TESOL and gifted and talented. So I have my master's in uh, TESOL and I have an extension in gifted and talented and I would never have pursued that in my, like I, I never would have pursued a gifted and talented extension. And the only reason that I did is because one of my first jobs, it was at a gifted and talented school. And they told us, if you're working here throughout the first year or two, you need to get this extension. Um, and this is a slightly side note, but I remember our colleagues of mine saying, I don't understand how you can really work at this school. I don't know why we have a, an ESL population that's gifted and talented. That seems like a dichotomy to me. And it really stuck with me because I kept thinking to myself, if I went to school in a different country and I didn't speak that language, it doesn't necessarily reflect on my cognitive abilities, it reflects on my linguistic abilities. So that was always interesting to me. And as soon as I started taking this coursework, I realized the connection is differentiation. And that kind of changed my, my mind to curriculum planning and lesson planning. And so um, I am going to break down how I use differentiation in my classroom. And it, it sometimes seems a little overwhelming, but once you get a little more familiar with how to do it, um, I always recommend trying like one thing a quarter or one thing a semester or one new thing a year. And over the course of the years, you will be able to develop an arsenal of teaching tools that are based in differentiation. So Carol Ann Tomlinson is essentially the guru for differentiation. I often reference this book. Um, it's a great text for teachers. It's very teacher friendly and it's essentially how to differentiate instruction. And what she says is that differentiation leads to equal access to excellent instruction. So our students are not the same, right? Everybody likes to lump in English language learners and 
um, they are different. And that's why I asked the question, what strengths and challenges do they bring to the classroom? Because they do bring different strengths, gifts and challenges to the classroom. Um, so we have to figure out how to meet them where they are at either their readiness levels or their interest levels so that they can access the instruction. So this is a chart that I really like to, to look at um, and it breaks down what differentiation is. And I always say the best way to start is to figure out what your students like, what are they interested in? It's much easier to plan things when you know a little bit about them. And that would be their interests, uh, their learner differences based by interest. And the other main area is their learner differences based by readiness. So you can't provide a text to a student like To Kill a Mockingbird <laughs> if they cannot read in English. You know, so it's just basic. Sometimes it seems a little too basic and obvious, but it's good to keep that in mind. So start with readiness level or interest. And from there, we are going to provide choice to our students. And if there's anything that you walk away understanding from today's session is that choice of content, choice of process, and choice of product is something that we can all do more of in our instruction to enhance learning for English language learners. It's giving them independence and agency. And I'm going to walk through how I do that and to give you some ideas of how you can do that in your classroom. The last part of this are the instructional strategies. And I'm gonna go over four today and three of them are listed here, learning contracts, learning centers, and tiered assignments. So I will give you uh, a few seconds to read this quote on the side. And I just wanna highlight essentially what differentiation is. And the important part is that we as teachers are responsible for our students' learning. And so if somebody doesn't have that knowledge of walking into a class or that foundational base, or they just have different gaps, or it's simply language, we have to come up with the objectives and the, and the curriculum materials that will allow them to access both the learning objectives and the language objectives. We need to use ongoing assessment to see where, where they are in, uh, their based on learner differences. And we have to provide a curated variety of learning experiences. So I love this quote. And like I said, this is from Carol Ann Tomlinson. And I, I often think back to it when I'm designing curriculum. So as we continue, I really want you to think about how these strategies and ideas and methodologies apply to you. How can you incorporate them into your current classroom? And um, we'll have an opportunity to share a little bit. So really, how does this apply for you and your teaching? So the first thing I wanted to go over was choice. And like I said, there are three different ways to incorporate choice into your classroom. The first of which is choice of content. So for example, I teach grades six, seventh and eighth. I often do projects with picture books. And nowadays we're lucky enough to have a variety of picture books that aren't very juvenile. Um, they address topics that are more mature. Um, so recently, um, you know, these books up here, I, I learned a lot about through a book box that addresses Latinx um, literature. And I try really hard to find picture books that are age appropriate and mature that also reflect the cultures in my classroom. Um, one picture book that I love in particular, and I often use this as a mentor text, is Teacup. Um, Teacup is a beautiful book. It is actually about a refugee um, and we do a lot of talking about it. There's very little text in it, but the text that is in it is extremely rich. And so what I do a lot of times with picture books is I print the text um, in a Word document so that the students have a text and it doesn't seem, you know, very kid-like. Um, but so this is just an example of something that I do, but the choice of content would be that all the students are essentially doing the same assignment. They are meeting the same learning objectives and language objectives that I as the teacher am putting forward, but they get to choose how they wanna interact with it. So they are selecting the book. Um, it seems a little scary at first, it's like letting go, but the students really engage and it, it is important for students to have that agency. 
Another way that you are able to uh, provide differentiation through choice is by differentiating the process. So going back to the fact that our students are all different, when students are able to show that they are learning and they are meeting the language and learning objectives, for me, I don't care if I'm providing a lot of scaffolding or a little bit less scaffolding and more option for you. So clearly we see on the right-hand side, um, students are provided with um, sentence frames. And this would be for more of a beginner student, a newcomer, an entering student that might need more support. And on the left-hand side, they are still addressing the same uh, questions, but they have more freedom. And so as you can see, the objective here is to write a summary. They're both doing it. It's just with more scaffolding and it's through a differentiated process. And to me, that's fine. I, I don't care how you're getting there. I am going to help you to get there by differentiating process. Another option for choice is by differentiation of product. So this was actually pulled right from an assignment that I gave in my class. And as you can see, it's a little menu. I'm not providing a ton of options here, but each student is required to fill out and uh, to complete an audio file. They can do either the identity survey or a haiku poem. They need to do Google Slides with audio. They can do a tour of their hometown or during vacation. And then they also have to provide a graphic using Adobe Spark. And again, they have two options here. Create an advertisement for someplace you visited or describe your favorite food or recipe. So I am allowing students to show me how they can best address the project or the assignment or the lesson. And th that is the choice of product. And then what we did is turned everything into a QR code so that people can kind of come by and scan it and then see their work, which is really fun and cool. I always try to include something that's a little more artistic and creative as well. So I feel like something like this, it does address differentiation and it also addresses learner differences, learner profiles. Um, so that's an example of a choice in product. Again, everybody's still meeting the curricular demands of the learning and language objectives. So I know we don't, let's see, I think we've got about 10 people in here. So instead of doing breakout rooms, um, we're gonna kind of talk together and I'm gonna try to not talk so much <laughs> for this part, but how does this apply to your teaching? So we just discussed choice of content, choice of product, and choice of process. So when you currently teach right now, and we're not trying to reinvent the wheel, with your current teaching, is there an assignment or a lesson or a project that you feel you can incorporate some kind of choice into? And if so, what would that be? What would that look like? So I'm hoping that people may be able to, um, to unmute and share, and we can maybe talk for about five to seven minutes, I think, about this. And again, um, we might even help each other figure it out. Um, if you have an idea, but you don't know exactly how you would incorporate choice here by providing different content or an option for process or product, hopefully somebody in the group might be able to. I can share. I um, I don't have a specific assignment in mind. Um, my district just two years ago invested in a curriculum that is extremely scripted, and um, this year invested in like two and a half more extremely scripted curriculum. So um, last year, uh, teachers were actually um, uh criticized for doing anything that deviated from that curriculum. Um, however, I have uh, managed to um, justify some stuff outside of the curriculum. I teach in 90 minute blocks and um, this particular curriculum, it's the, it's English 3D HMH. Um, uh, so I teach in 90 minute blocks and doing 90 minutes straight of this curriculum as scripted is extremely dense. Um, so I've taken 30 minutes out of that time to, so far I've been focusing on a lot of uh, communicative stuff, 
Um, but I could see integrating this, like creating some sort of project-based learning activity that I could do in that first 30 minutes before we go to English 3D. Because I've been doing, I've been rotating through a list of about 10 activities. These are my 10 activities and I rotate through them for the first 30 minutes. Um, just so that we're not doing English 3D for 90 minutes because that's just too much. Um, but I could see myself trying to design some sort of project-based learning thing where we could do that for the first 30 minutes before we go to English 3D. Um, because, I mean, honestly, my um, the, the reason I selected this was because I do have a big concern about... Um, I guess it's an equity issue with my ESL. So I look around my classroom and I look at my the, the schedules of my students and none of them are in honors courses. None of them are in courses that will actually prepare them for college. And the reason that they were placed in those courses is simply because of their language proficiency. So they, they don't have any exposure to any sort of accelerated or gifted programs simply because of their language proficiency. So, yeah, that is a big, um, that has been going on in the United States for decades. Yeah. Um, and all of that information, um, are, are you guys mostly in the DC area? You could even just do like a thumbs up on your, uh, I'm just curious in Maryland, yep, Delaware or Virginia. Okay, thank you, Margaret, Jenny, yep. Okay, you got perfect. Um, so you, all of that information is public. Um, so that, that is part of what gets reported by districts. Um, and I, I, I don't know because I'm in New York, but I'm assuming it would be a very similar process to get that information for your school district. And the, the data is staggering. Um, exactly what Amanda just said, L students are, the percentage that are placed in honors classes is so minuscule at the high school level. Wilmington, Delaware, okay. Oh, English in Japan, okay, got it. Maryland, awesome. Um, so if you have opportunities in your district, and I don't know, but um, that information alone is really powerful to see for administrators because it oftentimes comes in a pie chart. And that tiny little sliver that L's are a part of it's, it's amazing. So I have students who have been, who are born in the United States, have only gone to school here. Those students oftentimes are not in honors classes because of exactly what Amanda said. They might have a different uh, categorization, uh, classification. Um, yeah, so in, in New York, it is reported you have to do some digging. You can find it on your own. Um, and it will say stuff like AP classes. Um, and so, and so, and then it kind of correlates directly with graduation rates. You can do a lot of that, that, um, that digging on your own and that it is sad. And so, you know, this presentation is trying to provide some of, you know, I guess strategies, instructional strategies, but it's not necessarily about a, like a gifted and talented L population, um, if that makes sense. But that is a bigger question. It begs a bigger question of equity. You're absolutely correct. And so sometimes like bilingual programs do help with that, dual language programs can help with that. Um, but in that also is only for certain monolingual populations. But I'm, I'm definitely getting off track, and I could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> but um, would anybody else like to share here, even in the chat or unmute yourself? How would you be able to incorporate more choice into your teaching? Student choice, student agency, and again, focusing on content, process, or product. Well, I have something, but really quickly, and some, somewhere in this presentation, can you give resources? Because I co-teach English class. Sorry, I talk backwards. I feel so bad for people who talk to me in my everyday life. Um, but I co-teach an English class for seventh and eighth grade, uh, but their levels range from two to four. And it's really hard for me to find text that is not, I don't want to say condescending, but I want to find something that 
is for them all. So I guess somewhere, we don't have to talk about this right now, but somewhere, can you show me some resources for students that read at a lower level um, that are not too juvenile? Um, oh wait, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I saw your, your text in there that with the levels two to four, um, yes, I actually really strive to find texts that aren't juvenile or babyish. Um, and there are a ton out there. So for middle grades, yes, I can help you with that. Okay, and then um, I'm struggling with too much choice or too little choice. So I gave them um, an assignment with for figurative language, which obviously is very difficult for any child, not only L's. Um, and I gave them the ability to choose any song to illustrate like, onomatopoeia and similes and they they loved the the choice however they felt overwhelmed uh with the amount of choice and i'm struggling to figure out like how much is too much mm -hmm. but i want to give them enough if that makes yeah. sense so i um use the word curated choice sometimes because i'm just going to give an example so this example of the books. I have selected all of these books. If I said to students, go find a book and you are going to then talk about theme, like what? It's too overwhelming. Um, as the teacher, you're kind of curating things ahead of time. You're, you're going through them and you're saying like, this could be good. So I'm going to set this aside. When you open it up, it's like the floodgates come, you know, like the water comes gushing. It's too overwhelming and they can't accomplish anything, nor would I, you know, if somebody said like, go, um, like your example, I love music. I listen to music all the time. If somebody put me on the spot and said, go find a song that blah, 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 I would probably have to think for like a week <laughs> about it. And it's not that I, I can't do it. It's just going to take me a long time. So I think it's important to comb through resources ahead of time, and then you can provide them to them. And it's okay. Even if a student, two students choose the same book or the same song, but you have given them a limited amount within the, those 10 songs that you select, they can then go through it. You know, they can choose which one they feel connects best with them. So that would be my suggestion. I think ahead of time, it's important for teachers to kind of go through and curate the collection. And from that curated collection, you still have some control, but they are really selecting what they like. Okay, and this is one last thing because I saw that you're a co-teacher. So what do you do when you co-teach and your content teacher wants you to move at a faster rate, but you understand that your L's are simply not getting it and you're trying to like be their ambassador, but it's just, um, how do we do that when we want to differentiate an assignment or lesson so that it's accessible to all? Yeah, that, that is an amazing question that you just brought up. And I would say that that falls a lot on planning. Um, where I work and because I teach in different grades and different content areas, the planning that we have is so limited. And that is something that as teachers, we don't have a lot of control over. I've talked to administration about that saying, if I am trying to help students move forward and meet these curricular goals. I need to know ahead of time what they're doing so that I can then differentiate the assignment ahead of time. And oftentimes what happens is the curriculum moves, the year goes on, and we're trying to play catch up. And then they start missing assignments, and their grades fall. And so I would say if it's possible to try to plan ahead of time with that co-teacher and to try to pre-select certain texts that they will be accessing, certain texts that they will be reading, and it, again, it doesn't have to be a class text. They can be doing something different, but they're still meeting those language and learning objectives. Um, it's hard to do once you're kind of behind the eight ball. Um, but I would say planning time and really the relationship with the content area teacher are two, are two things that have to be worked on and developed and also the support of the school and administration. Thank you. Um, I don't know if that helps, but uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving and then we'll have more time for questions at the end. 
Okay, so we are going to now talk about specific um, gifted and talented strategies that I use in the classroom. And I did wanna share another resource and I have this at the end as well, but this is the text that I often use. Um, we use this in the course that I took to get my extension for gifted and talented education. Um, and some of the materials like the chart that I shared before, that is from this text. So I still reference it often as I am designing projects for my students. And the first one, the first strategy that I did wanna share is a planning calendar. So a planning calendar is essentially a tool that students use every day for setting a goal and for saying whether or not they worked hard, didn't work hard over the course of a project. And this is essentially what it looks like. So I create these for my students. And as you can see at the top, there's a goal and a reflection, and I am asking them to write in, what are you going to work on today? So in Amanda's example of the first 30 minutes of her class, maybe she would be doing something like this. You have choice here. I'm giving them the scope of the project. What are you specifically going to work on in the next 30 minutes? And sometimes I help them out, and you can see I might write in complete identity survey or invite teachers. And at the end of the class, they have to tell me, how did I do? How did I work today? It's okay if you had a bad day. I don't mind, but you need to tell me why. So this is a metacognitive practice. I love using a planning calendar over the course of a project, which I usually have for two to three weeks. And why it works is that it promotes independence, autonomy, and self-pacing while still allowing student agency and choice. So a little up close view of this, this is what it would basically look like. Every day they have to come and fill it out. And if they're absent, then I know, and we write an A up top. So I could say to them afterwards or throughout the course of the project, well, you've been working on the same goal for four days. What's going on, right? How can we help you move forward? Um, so I love using a planning calendar. The second tool that I like to use is a learning contract. So a learning contract is exactly that. It's basically between the teacher and the student, and it's agreeing upon all of the tasks that the student has to accomplish or complete throughout those two to three weeks on the project. And this is an example. This is something that, again, these are all from my classroom, things that I have made. Um, and you can see I, I, I front load the directions, and I have a due date up at the top. I love numbered lists, it's very easy to follow. And then towards the end, here's a little checklist. Did you complete the first graphic organizer? Did you do the KWL chart? So it's very organized for them and it's one piece of paper. So they can always reference back to it and it's to help them move through the project on their own. So students might be working at different paces and that's okay but they have clear expectations from the beginning of the project that lead toward achieving the learning objectives. Now, the next one that I'm going to share, and I'm, I'm going to differentiate this by saying that in my opinion and experience working with language learners, the learning contract and a tiered assignment are somewhat similar, but I wanted to share both of them so that you can say, oh, I would use this over that because it works for my students. So the learning contract is the contract, the agreement between the student and the teacher and a tiered assignment, which looks somewhat similar, is essentially different versions of tasks and activities based on students' readiness levels or interests that lead toward achieving the learning objectives. So within your class, you might have maybe three of these versions or maybe two of these versions so to address the question before about how do I differentiate when I'm co-teaching, a tiered assignment might be a way to differentiate. Oftentimes when I'm in an ELA class, they're expected to write a narrative that is two pages long or um, an essay that has to have a beginning, a middle and an end at least one page long. Maybe you change that to the beginning, middle and end of only one sentence each. Um, but I find that the tiered assignment is a way to address different learner profiles. And it does provide equal access to curriculum and opportunities for everybody to learn. So again, I like doing a numbered list here and a simple box. So did they do, 
Did they find the article? And again, I am curating the articles that they're going to look through. I'm not gonna provide, go ahead and look at Newzella and choose an article. I'm selecting maybe five articles. And then from those five articles, they get to choose which one. And then they know after I choose the article, I have to look at the vocabulary list that goes with that article. Did I do that? Now I'm gonna highlight those vocabulary words in the article. Okay, so it's not constantly telling them, you need to do this now, you need to do that now. They're all working independently and you have an opportunity to circulate and to confer. Oops, sorry, I have a hand out there, not supposed to be there. And then the, uh, the learning centers, these are opportunities for students to basically dive deeper or enrich the aspect of the project that they are working on. They're like stations. So a lot of teachers do this and without even realizing it, that is like a gifted and talented strategy. So why they work is that, again, you're, you're in control of this you are designing those enrichment experiences. However, the student then can walk over and say, oh yeah, I do wanna do a little more research on the computer right now about this specific project. Or I do need to kind of read these extra articles that Ms. Vanacore provided in the binder that's just sitting there. If they need to do that, they can do that. Um, so that's what a learning center is. And I'm sure many of you have experience with this. It's very common at the elementary level. And I often wonder why it kind of goes away at the secondary level, but I do find it to be extremely beneficial for language learners. And it's also a way to kind of fill in certain gaps, if you will, for those students with limited inter or interrupted formal education. So I did want to know now if we can pause for a minute and see if, if there are questions about the planning calendar, a learning contract, a tiered assignment, or a learning center. And also, if there aren't questions, does anybody have experience working with these? Or can you think about an assignment, a lesson, or a project that you currently do that might uh, benefit from the use of one of these strategies. Again, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Everybody does amazing work already, but how might you incorporate one of these strategies to bolster a project, a lesson? And you can type in the chat if you want. And actually, why don't I share examples from my classroom? And maybe as I'm doing that, if you have an idea or a question, you can write it in the chat or just unmute. And maybe it'll, it'll uh, be a little easier to think about it when you see some examples. Um, so at the end of a project that I use in my classroom, which again, is usually about two to three weeks long. And as you can see in the planning calendar, I block it out day to day. I always have um, a live, whoops, let me go back one, sorry. I always do, um, oh, it's, it's just keeping, it's going there constantly. Can I do it down here? Here we go. So I always provide an opportunity for students to have a live audience. Um, and I would recommend this highly, um, regardless of the grade that you teach, regardless of the context, I think it's really important for going back to how language is power, students' voice and choice, they need to be heard and seen, especially when we work with students who oftentimes are not heard or seen. Um, in my classroom, once a quarter, I do a project. And at the end of that project, students are asked to invite two staff members to my class, to our class. And I provide refreshments, it's like a little party and they get up and they have to do a presentation. Um, the amount of positive feedback that I have received, not just from students, but from staff has been astounding over the last few years. I have teachers that say to me, I have never heard this kid talk. I have never, and that is accurate. A lot of our students aren't going to raise their hand in front of a group of 25 to 30 kids. So when suddenly the tables are turned and the spotlight is on them, it is amazing and absolutely beautiful what can happen. 
and the students uh, become the teacher almost and the presenter and the teachers become the viewer or the student. Um, thank you, Adam. And so last year, obviously, and for some people who still teach in a virtual context, I did them virtually. So students projects, I created a website um, with Wakelet. Again, it's a free software. And this talked a little bit about what the project was. Um, how can you transform the world around you? And then students, we posted their presentations here. And they, and you could tell they all look very different and their presentations are all very different. They record their voice while they go through their slides. And they then, we shared this with staff in our building. And so a lot of people got to view their presentations in the virtual realm, the digital world. So there still is, you know, opportunity for that um, if you still are teaching virtually. Um, all right, so I am just going to share some examples from my classroom. And like I said, if you have any ideas um, from seeing some of these examples that you wanna share in the chat, um, please feel free. So this is one of my students from a few years ago. So um, Faven, I don't wanna mispronounce her name, but you will see some resources and books that I really love to use that have um, text that is very accessible for middle school students. And I would say for high school students as well, my recommendation would be to type the text out. And just to give you an example of what I'm talking about, I type the text from picture books so it looks like this. And then I often incorporate a skill. So we might be annotating, we might be jotting, we might be practicing asking questions, but they have this in front of them instead of a picture book. When you need to differentiate, you can provide the picture book to say, hey, like I know that this student has lower literacy, they would benefit from the physical picture book in their hand. And like I said, I might give that to a student who is a SIFE student or a SLIFE student or very low literacy. But for everybody else, I'm gonna type it up and it looks like this. And that student that has the picture book should also have this as well. So this is an example of differentiation of con um, content. So all the students chose a different book. Uh, One Green Apple is a, about a refugee coming to the United States. And I like that book. It talks about New York, right? The uh, apples is our, our fruit. This is um, Going Home, a great story about a family coming to the United States, returning back to Mexico, rich pictures, very mature content. Um, here's an example of a basic learning station. I had a student that, you know, hated art, hated painting, but I was doing this in June and I thought this would be a fun way to end the year. And these students needed a lot of support. Who did they go to look up? Pablo Picasso. I didn't tell them to, but that was a name that they knew. They needed to do a little extra research to get some ideas. Here's an example of uh, differentiation of product. So we did a project on global warming because students in my, one of my sections were really interested in the environment. They had an option to do a poster. They had an option to do a cube. Now this clearly um, has less text and less writing. So that might be better for a student that might be uh, more beginner. Um, and then here is another example to go back to differentiated texts. I love to have students record their reading on Vocaroo. It's a free application. I would recommend everybody to just write that name down and maybe try to figure out how to use it. So this would be something that is for a beginner student. The Garfield comic, comic doesn't have a lot of text. It's very visual, but we're working on problems and solutions. We're also working on setting. So those are the language objectives there. And then the learning objectives are identifying problems and solutions. Here would be a differentiated example for somebody who might be more intermediate. I'm removing the scaffolding, I'm removing those sentence frames and supports, and I'm hoping that they can answer in a full sentence. And again, this is a verbal response. So they are speaking, um, you know, when we're thinking about the four modalities of reading, writing, listening, and speaking, they are speaking there. Um, so also Faven to talk about um, different texts. I love working with mini fiction. Mini fiction, you can literally Google it, mini fiction, and you will get a ton of free resources. This is a text that I absolutely love to work with. This is 
uh, you could go very deep with this text. Um, you can also talk about something very simple such as family, father, son. And it begs the question, where is the mother? What is happening? So we do a lot of questions about this and I'm gonna get to something um, a little bit deeper that I use with this text. But just so you know, um, this is a past tense text. Um, I said it's very deep. And the reason being is that it's all based on this broken vase and the father gets upset and he almost goes to hit the son, but he doesn't. And so we end up talking a lot about, and when I say this takes a good chunk of time, possibly a few periods to discuss this text, why was the vase so important? And I have had students tell me after we do an exercise and the skill that I, I use for this is how do we write questions about a text? We often ask, where is the mother? And I have had students say, I think the mother died. And I think her ashes were in this vase. Are they saying this in perfect English? No, but that's why the father got so upset. So the, the things that come out of these mini fiction texts, they're not reading pages and pages, but the same skills are being addressed in something very short and deep. So, here are three examples, and I know that we're coming to an end of our session here, but these are three examples of how I differentiate based on the same text here. So you can see on the left, this would be for a beginner. So we're gonna to try to write two questions, and then you are gonna to try to write one section, I think, and we're all going back to the text. Everything is rooted in the text. This might be for an intermediate student, and this might be for an advanced student. And as we move to a higher level, we are introducing, I used to think, but after reading and questioning the text, now I think. And I do provide an example here for each of the, the students. You may not want to, but I do think that this is, um, mini fiction is, is a great route to go when you're looking for texts that really address different skills um, and you can easily differentiate this. Um, so I think we are just about out of time. Um, so I did want to send a brief survey and ask if anybody had questions, um, while we are wrapping up right here. Any clarifications? I see things in the chat. Oh, okay. So we have um, Adam also sent something. This is a very brief survey. Okay, thank you, Faven. I just wanted to make sure. Does anybody have any questions about anything? I know it is seems overwhelming, but as I said before, I would start small, try with one thing, a planning calendar perhaps, or just providing choice of content. Erin, I think we do need to wrap up just because the next session is probably coming in in just a second. But thank you so much. Um, if you know everyone, um, if you could join me in thanking the presenter, Erin, great job, wonderful. Um, and so, uh, yes, I, uh, in addition to what Erin posted in the chat, um, let's see, uh, I have also posted the. Um, what TESOL 2021 feedback survey. So at the end of the day, if you could just fill that out for us, that would be great. Um, good, and uh, so enjoy the next session. Um, and these will be recorded. So we'll be uploading those to Canvas so you can go back and review and, and check in on that at a later date. So thank you so much. It says Adam that, um, or Aaron, that we need permission to see that. Um, I see Adam's, but I don't see Aaron's. It says I need permission. I, I'm sorry, I thought that I had changed it. I will try, otherwise, don't worry about it. Um, I appreciate it though, and I hope you guys have a great day. I'll try to change the uh, permissions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day at the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam.
Thank you, Erin. Yes. Uh, are you going to be attending the other sessions today? I, I'm not, unfortunately. I know. I wish. Um, but I appreciate it so much. Thank you for all of your help. And I'm, I should probably log out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day. It was an excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Adam. Good to see you. Hello. Good to see you too. So, are is this your you're the next yes. one, right? So, yes. I'm going to hand over um, host ability to you. you. Make host. All right. And I don't know if you need to if we need to. I'll cut off the recording. <laughs>